it was a little deja vu at the 2024 Australian Grand Prix because we felt like we've seen this movie before. Max Verstappen retiring from a race in Melbourne and a Ferrari going on to win. And also Carlos Sainz being the man to stop another Max Verstappen win streak. It was certainly a very eventful 2024 Australian Grand Prix. And we're here to recap it all here on the Backmarkers F1 Show podcast. This is episode number 141 of the pod. And of course, I am joined today another full house by my fellow backmarkers. I am Chris Cato. That is Tyler McDonald and Shaker Barty joining in from Ottawa. How are you boys doing today? Good. It was a fantastic race, an overnight race for us here in Ottawa. Started about uh, just after midnight, I guess. So I uh, stayed up for that one a little late night, but it was well worth it in the end. Yeah, it seems like a little bit of that Australian heat decided to come over to Ottawa our way for the last few days too, which has been nice. But yeah, it great race, you know, might always like to stay up for the overnights because it may sometimes it's not worth it. But this race was uh, definitely a little worth it. By heat shaker means it's 10 degrees Celsius here today, which is <laughs> better <laughs> than negative 20. Let's eat. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good temperature. Maybe not Australia level, but <laughs> certainly it is at this time of the year over there. But yeah, well, it was well worth the, uh, staying up for you guys and for other areas in the world. It's kind of a hard time zone, of course, being it so far away. But wherever you were in the world, I'm sure that it was worth getting up early or staying up late because it ended up being so far the best race of the season. And of course, such a surprise result to see a non-Red Bull win. We were just speaking before we got on air. We didn't really know what to do when we saw somebody other than Max Verstappen and win a Grand Prix because it just felt like it's been so long. But what an interesting parallels. The last time a non-Red Bull driver won a Grand Prix in the last 25 races was in fact Carlos Sainz in the Ferrari at last year's Singapore Grand Prix. And here he is again, breaking another Max Verstappen win streak. He did it in Singapore, did it here in Australia, and ended up taking his third career victory. So let's start off by talking about Carlos Sainz because what a performance this was. He was coming off just 15 days removed from his operation for his appendicitis in Saudi Arabia. We weren't even really sure whether he was going to be fit enough for this race and fit enough. Maybe he wasn't, but certainly mentally he was because he came out of the blocks and was just driving phenomenal from FP1 all the way throughout the race. Was a little bit lucky, of course, with the Verstappen DNF. But Tyler, let's start with you. What did you make of Carlos Sainz's drive at the Australian Grand Prix? All things considered with his appendicitis, but just in general as well, how well he drove to that race victory. I think it has to be up there with one of the best drives in the last 10 years, if not the last 20 years. I mean, unbelievable from Carlos Sainz. I'm sure the pain he was going through. I know he was uh, saying that, I don't know if he was saying it to Lando in the post-race interviews, but uh, that he could feel that like almost like an, an empty spot in his uh, abdomen area where the appendix was gone and with the G-forces, you could feel the kind of stuff sloshing around in there. I couldn't imagine the weird feeling that, that would be. And you saw his baby was all bandaged up as well post-race, but unbelievable. We all thought that uh, it was going to be Ollie Behrman back in the race car for this weekend, but Sainz, who didn't look too great uh, physically-wise in FP1, FP2, um, and certainly very gingerly walking around getting out of the car, but man, was he on point during the race and just a, an inspiring drive from Carlos. And I think that it has to go down as one of the better drives in the last 10 years. And if not the last 20 years. Yeah. I don't know what kind of painkillers these F1 drivers get post-surgery, <laughs> um, but they're amazing. So, uh, you know, kudos to uh, Lance Stroll from last year too, who did it with what, like broken fingers. Uh, no, totally kidding, but no, amazing drive from Carlos Sainz overall. Uh, just obviously to recover within a week, uh, bandaged up, probably had a little bit of, you know, a little bit of pressure there the entire time that he was racing with the G-forces like Tyler mentioned. Um, so incredible drive for him and probably will go down as one of his best drives of all time um, or even one of his best race weekends of all time for, for the way he performed. Yeah, definitely. Indeed. I mean, it was just and he was on the pace really from FP1. And you said before going into the weekend that 
he wasn't obviously going to check with the doctors after the first few practice sessions. And if he wasn't feeling fit, or if he didn't feel like he was capable, then he would have taken himself out. But uh, he was capable. Of course, he had the limitations, certainly a lot of pain still and things like that. But this story is just really incredible. And like you said, Tyler, I do definitely think that his it has to go up there with one of the better drives in recent memory, just because of the circumstances. You see here on the photo, only 15 days, really the difference, 15, 16 days, the difference between him lying in a hospital bed and him going on to win a Grand Prix. And just the fact that he was driving a Formula One car and this Melbourne with, with the alterations to the circuit, there's a lot of more high speed corners here. So certainly for a, a driver recovering from a surgery with those stitches and, and everything like that, that's a lot of G being pulled on the body, on the core, especially. So I thought what he did was uh, absolutely incredible. And the scenes that we saw afterwards when uh, he, he finally took the victory and really well deserved. And I think that science has been completely on it so far in 2024. And we're going to get to the discussion of his free agency in just a minute. But he drove a really fantastic race. And even if Verstappen wouldn't have had the brake issue and had he stayed in the race, I think the consensus amongst the pit lane and the other drivers as well was that science would have still been able to challenge for the, for the victory. I think it would have been close. I don't know if he would have gotten the victory done because Max Verstappen is Max Verstappen. He's going to do his thing. And of course, it puts also a lot more pressure on Ferrari as well for nailing the strategies and things like that. But I think that really the SF24 had the pace to win this Grand Prix with Verstappen in the race or not, which is very, very promising to see. So I think that's the other positive thing here for Ferrari is that for the first time this season, they were on par with Red Bull on qualifying and in race pace. Well, we saw how much of an issue Sergio Perez had uh, after about 10 laps on his tires with the graining. I think that's a huge issue for uh, for Red Bull and we'll see if that continues going on for the rest of the season or if it was just more of, of a case of it being at Melbourne but I mean the pace was there in the Red Bull to start off but I mean, even Sergio Perez couldn't catch uh, was it a Mercedes that he was trying to catch or no it was the McLaren sorry um, he couldn't catch Piastri or Norris I mean he ended up 21 seconds behind them at the end of the race which is not like a Red Bull to do so um the tire issues were huge for for Red Bull and I'm not sure if there's any underlying issues with Sergio's car like there was with Max's car and we I'm sure we will touch on that in a little bit but boys I don't know do you guys have your appendix still I, I mean I, I still do so I couldn't imagine what it's like but uh, I want to know if you guys because if you guys can provide an insight on how the surgery goes then uh... I still have mine so I can't no insight from me I, I also still have my appendix, oh, okay. appendix so oh, well. I, I can't really give any insight into it. Um, <laughs> okay, we'll have to find someone who has those removed, and we'll have to ask them. I'm sure there'll be a comment. <laughs> I, but, I mean, like, having surgery in general, it takes at least, like, you know, minimum two weeks to recover from a cut or some kind of, so where they dig into your body, depending on where it is, right? Um, my, like, my friend uh, just, like, broke his arm and ended up getting a bunch of, like, broke his arm right here. And ended up going into surgery and got a bunch of like bolts and metal pieces basically put into his arm. And it took him like three, two and a half months to fully recover. He's now fully, now he's allowed to hold up like th up to 350 pounds of weight. But like up before that, he wasn't, yeah, I mean, that's insane amount of weight. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I mean, before that, it just, it took him forever. So I can't even, I mean, that's a body part that just like, I, I don't know. I, I can't, but um, still to recover from it and still be able to race, I think is quite incredible. And as well as to get P1. Um, can Ferrari continue into next weekend where we go into Japan? Um, I mean, we'll have to see. I'm sorry, not next weekend, but the weekend after that. Um, but it, it, it'd be really interesting to see if Red Bull continues to have this issue on tracks like this or with temperatures like this throughout the year as well, because then it just and it's going to be a problem that they're going to have to look into sooner rather than later. Yeah, it does. It does provide a potential vulnerability of the RB20 on high graining tracks. 
that maybe they are susceptible to competition like Ferrari or even McLaren on later on in the year. But uh, regardless, the improvements that Ferrari have made, credit to them. They uh, A lot of people were skeptical of some of the changes that they made in the preseason, but they seem to have worked well. They've taken a good step forward. And uh, let's see, Japan is a much different circuit. And I think that we're going to see kind of back to the same in terms of Red Bull and Verstappen uh, performing well there. But that'll be in a few weeks' time. So let's keep on this race here. And we do have to talk about the Carlos Sainz free agency situation. And the big question after this Grand Prix, and I think one that wasn't being asked enough before the Australian Grand Prix was, how the hell is Carlos Sainz still unemployed for 2025? I know that the situation is still new and it's fresh with Lewis Hamilton signing for Ferrari and the driver's market is still early on in the season, but it's still crazy to me that team like Mercedes, for example, almost seemed not interested in Carlos Sainz's services and instead putting their money on possibly Kimi Antonelli, an unproven rookie in Formula 2. And I just think Carlos Sainz, for me, is probably the most underrated driver on the grid this season. And I think that he's such a great asset, asset to any team, especially a team like Mercedes or even Aston Martin or wherever he would go. But I think that Carlos Sainz really, really shot his stock up after the Australian Grand Prix. And if you really look at it, guys, had he not missed the 2024 Saudi Arabian Grand Prix, he'd be leading the world championship right now because he got the P3 in Bahrain. I'm assuming he would have finished at least in the top three, top four in Saudi Arabia. Who knows? Maybe even better. And of course, with his race victory in Australia and the DNF from Verstappen, he'd be championship leader at this, uh, at this point. So from what I've seen from him in 2024, I don't know if the, the whole losing his seat most likely lit a fire under him. But since the beginning of preseason testing until now, he's been absolutely on it. So... I don't know. These teams like Mercedes, I know Red Bull is being in, thrown into the mix uh, about potentially signing him, but I really hope that he can find some sort of a seat at a top team because he really deserves it. Yeah, absolutely does. And I, my first inkling would be go back to Red Bull. They have the best car on the grid. I, if you're Red Bull, I don't care if I know Sergio Perez is in a deal for next year. I don't care if he signs next. I don't care what the situation is. You're signing Carlos Sainz. You know, if Max leaves and you get Sainz and Perez, maybe. But if Max stays and you have a pair, or you have a a Sainz Max one two, and what a battle that would be between those two drivers. I mean, that'd be really really tasty to see that inner team battle as well. So I would love for him to sign with Red Bull. I think it'd be a phenomenal fit for both drivers. They're they're familiar with each other, of course. With um, Carlos being a Red Bull junior driver growing up, and maybe what a huge regret Red Bulls making now thinking after releasing him to Renault and then obviously went with to McLaren after that. So um, I think that's his best fit. Personally, I wouldn't want to see him in an Aston Martin or depending on what a Mercedes is doing right now. I don't think I'd even want to see him in a Mercedes personally. I, I want to see him in that Red Bull. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with you. I think Red Bull is kind of the best place for Carlos signs. Um, be, not having a drive next year but i think the red bull predicament uh across uh you know the racing bulls as well as red bull is pretty pretty big at the moment because i'm pretty sure daniel ricardo has also been given the, the well not the boot but given the uh given the words of i think if, if he doesn't perform in the next few races he's going to be replaced by liam lawson so i think they're in a really, really weird predicament uh, with, I mean, in a gr good predicament with having such a big pool of drivers to pick from and drivers that would want to drive for them as well because they already have a winning car for the last three years, potentially this year as well. Uh, and I mean, from what everyone's saying, they have already have their car ready for next year and they're already developing it. So they're in a very good place at the moment uh, to be able to do what they want, I guess. Um, and unfortunately, I think Carlos Sainz is also doing the best that he can in the performances that he ha that that he's had to be able to choose what he wants if there is open dry open seats next year. Yeah, I said this as soon as we heard the news that Hamilton was going to Ferrari. I made a video exactly on this topic that he should sign or Red Bull should pursue Carlos Sainz. And this was in the preseason. And I know a lot of people kind of disagreed with that and said it wouldn't be the right fit and et cetera, and et cetera. But I really thought that him going back to that Red Bull program would be the best for him at this moment. I think that he was 
always, I wouldn't say destined for a promotion to Red Bull, but always just missed out on a promotion to Red Bull. And I think that they made a mistake. I think Christian Horner, Helmut Marko, the bosses at Red Bull made a mistake not si- signing Carlos Sainz because I think he's a top driver. I don't think he's at the level of a Max Verstappen, but to you know, not many drivers are in in that respect, but he would be an excellent teammate pairing. He was teammates with Verstappen. I know that was a very different time. They were very young. They're a lot more mature now. I think they'd work together extremely well. And Red Bull would be far more competitive, in my opinion, now than they would be with Sergio Perez. And also, if you were to sign Carlos Sainz now for 2025 and beyond, you're signing a driver that's more also for your future, potentially in the post Verstappen era. A lot of rumors still swirling around about Max's future. He's got the contract till 2028. But with the new engine coming in in 2026 and a lot of big questions surrounding that, if Max decides to jump ship to another team or to even retire from F1 because of the demanding schedule, you've got a driver that was science who's still under the age of 30. He's got plenty of years to go. And he's only just getting to that elite level. He's getting better and better as each season has gone on. Whereas if you were to re-sign a Perez, for example, for another year or two, you're kind of limited in how long Perez is going to stick around. And the question, obviously, with Sergio, as he's shown in the last few seasons, is how good will he be able to be throughout the course of a full season, especially if the field gets closer. So I agree with you guys there. For me, he should sign with Red Bull if the opportunity is there. And Tyler, to your point, I think going to Mercedes at this point is not looking very good after what they've shown in this race into the start of this season. And after that, where else would you go? Are you going to sign to Audi, which is an interesting project, but Sauber not looking very good at the moment? Big questions there. Aston Martin, which is kind of seeming to be destined maybe only a midfield team. And outside of that, not many options. No, there isn't many options. And obviously, I think uh, there's only a few drivers that are officially signed for, for next year. But you mentioned that Audi project over at Sauber, Chris. I mean with the way things are going right now, you almost have to wonder if I know um, Audi took hundred percent team ownership uh, into salary, but you almost want to take over now on the back end of things to try and steer the ship around with the R and D. And especially, I mean, simple things like wheel nuts. I mean, they're, I guess we think they're simple. Maybe they're not so simple to manufacture, but you just don't hear of things like that going wrong. And you just have to wonder if, if stuff like that's going wrong, what other stuff behind the scenes aren't aren't figured out properly as well over on that side too. So dwindling down, I mean, I, I really think that Red Bull, if you're Carlos Sainz, you're holding out for a Red Bull seat to try and win a world championship. Because in the end, that's the goal, isn't it? To be a world champion, not necessarily who's going to pay the most for it. Most drivers think that way. So um, especially most top end drivers like Carlos. So I, I would think yeah, I'd be holding out for that Red Bull seat. Um, yeah, I mean, to be honest, I think he would, I don't think he would be the best pairing for Max Verstappen, but I think it would be an interesting, uh, pairing in terms of what they would both bring to the races itself. Um, maybe, you know, uh, not as crazy as we would see, uh, with Hamilton and Rosberg, but Sainz is, a, Sainz is a fighter. We've seen him every, you know, in the last few years at uh, Ferrari step up whenever he's been told to swap seats with Leclerc. I uh, mean, Leclerc the same way. Uh, they're, they're very much want to be the number one driver on the team that they're on. Um, and no matter what doubts that they have, they always seem to prove themselves uh, to be that number one driver, or, you know, not be the number two driver on the team that they're on. So. Yeah, we'll see what happens, but it, it's it's really a shame that he's out of a seat at Ferrari because I think that he was very good for Ferrari. I know that they couldn't pass up on an opportunity to sign Hamilton, so I don't think it was a mistake in that regard. But I mean, who knows? Maybe after a few years, Sainz will be able to go back to Ferrari. But it, it's such a shame because I think he's a very good driver and highly underrated. So we'll see where his future ends up. But uh, yeah, great victory from Sainz. Great victory for Formula One as well to see some fresh winners, a non-Red Bull winner. And as you see, if you guys maybe haven't noticed, if you're watching us on video here on YouTube, we're going with a little bit of an Italian flair in mm-hmm. our uh, outfits for, for today's podcast. We got uh, two Roma jerseys and an Italian jersey. So yeah, we're uh, repping the Scuderia and uh, it was great to hear the uh, national anthem of Italy once again. It's been a little bit too long since we've heard it. 
one, it's the best anthem in the world. Um, I'm not even close because I'm half Italian, but it's not even close. It's the best anthem in the world. So um, there's that going for you. Yeah, Chris, you're repping the, the scuderia as well with your headphones. Yes, yes, I am. I got the. Uh, I don't know if you guys turn it on to the side. Ferrari headphones, but I've gone even. I've gone even a little bit more Italian with oh, the uh, the Alfa Romeo cap. So uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, keep me. Yeah, so the honorary uh, there you Italian go. Reason for both Italian teams. Yeah, Kimi last uh, the uh, last Formula One World Champion for uh, Ferrari still. <laughs> True, still. I, know, <laughs> I know the Tifosi don't want to be reminded of that, but. <laughs> It's coming soon, hopefully. <laughs> Patience. Maybe. Uh, maybe maybe it's Lewis's eighth. I don't know. Yeah, maybe. We'll see. I mean, yeah, there's a good chance of that happening for sure. But <laughs> we're getting a little too ahead of ourselves. So uh, let's move on to what really kind of sparked the surprise victory for Carlos Sainz. And that was, of course, the, uh, the issue for Max Verstappen. And uh, if you guys obviously didn't notice, I noticed it pretty early on in the race that there was some smoke coming out of the back of the car and i know that the commentators were saying oh maybe it's an engine engine but i knew it wasn't an engine because i could see it was coming from the right hand side of his car and uh let me just see if i can pull it up here if i could find it we got the video of his smoking brakes oh man where did i put it uh aha uh -huh, here it is Apologies for that little delay here, folks. So yeah, we got the... This was kind of around lap four. And the exit of... Uh, I think it was turn two, turn three. And then you could really see the uh, moment when the brake kind of comes apart. And the issue was that it was a brake caliper that was stuck on from lights out. It wasn't an issue from the Brembo brakes itself. It was... What was reported afterwards was that it was some sort of an issue with the construction of how it was fitted onto the car. There was some sort of a mistake. And that led to the issue as well. And as you could see, when he came into the pit lane, it literally exploded as, uh, as he came to the, the pit lane line. And then, of course, caught fire in the end. And there was no chance. Once that issue happened, there was no chance of him being able to continue on into the race. So very strange incident. I don't think we've ever seen really one that like this before. We've seen kind of melting brakes before, but not really a caliper that was stuck on like that. So that was on fire, went into the pit lane. And then this was the aftermath. Uh, we'll have to share this tab here and as you can see the aftermath of his tire as well it pretty much just cooked the rim and everything so uh, his race was done it ended a streak of 43 consecutive points finishes like shaker said uh, off the air in our podcast maybe he retired on purpose because he didn't want to touch that number 44 he doesn't like that number so maybe that was the reason why but i mean it was bound to happen eventually right he wasn't able to equal his 10th consecutive race win streak but uh, nonetheless it happens and he handled it pretty well he knows that uh, this kind of happens in f1 so uh, unfortunate for for max Verstappen fans i guess we really don't feel that bad for him because he's won plenty in the last little while no it's but it is very unique incident that did happen right i mean obviously those brakes are changed before um every i'm not sure if it's every day or every session with the amount of brakes that they use so obviously an installation issue as you mentioned chris but that explosion there actually wasn't the actual brake itself, that's the tire exploding. We saw this a couple of years ago in NASCAR where there was a fire, brake fire and uh, the tire changed, went to go change the tires and the, the tire exploded right in front of their faces. And uh, everyone was okay, thank God, but it was a pretty loud bang. So the heat, what happened there, um, swelled up the tire so much that um, mm -hmm. it lost its form or conformity and, and exploded. So that's the explosion you saw, which was pretty wild. I know. Even the commentators didn't know too much about that, but I quickly remembered what happened in NASCAR a few years ago. I was like, ah, this is exactly what, what happened. But um, too bad for Max. It would have been nice to see a race between him and Science, but at the same time, like you mentioned, Chris, not feeling too, too bad for him. I mean, he had enough luck going his way. 43 in a row without any sort of failures is pretty impressive in Formula 1. Yeah, and, and I, like, honestly, the best circumstance in terms of that failure to happen uh not happening going into a big turn or when he has to do a big break and he's got he's got nothing there um so honestly the fact that he was able to limp at home the way that he was that he did and not have it happen on a turn and go ha basically crash out into the wall or something like that uh i think is a win-win situation for red bull in the end that you know they didn't lose a car completely as well as have max hurt at the same time so 
Yeah, great point. You know, he wasn't, he was safe in that regard and he was able to bring the car home. So there was no massive damage to the car. And of course, anytime a driver crashes, uh, there's a risk to his safety as well. So yeah, all is well, it ends well. And going into Japan, I mean, th that Suzuka circuit is meant for this RB20. So much like his poor performance at last year's Singapore Grand Prix, then going to Japan again, and when he dominated the field, I think we're going to see something similar like that. So uh, we're going to see Max Verstappen bounce back. Don't you worry about that. But what is interesting is following this race, it does give us a little bit of a close championship for the first time in quite a while because let me share with you guys here the driver standings after the Australian Grand Prix and I couldn't believe this myself I'm like look at how close that is it is four points between Verstappen and Leclerc Sergio Perez is in the mix just behind there in five points even Carlos Sainz having missed a race only 11 points off of Max Verstappen and I know I know everybody out there I'm not trying to get too optimistic this is mainly because Verstappen did not finish but it goes to show what happens when reliability strikes and opportunities open and going into Japan, at least we finally have a open and competitive world championship. And here you see the constructors championship as well. It is even closer now between Red Bull and Ferrari, only four points. And there you can see the comparison between 2023 and 2024. And I had to reread 2023 again because I could not believe the gap at this point last year between Aston Martin and Red Bull. I mean, it was massive. So Maybe let's not get too optimistic, but something interesting now that the championship is close, right? Absolutely. It gives us something to look forward to. And what really catches my eye, too, is just the fact that the bottom three teams uh, this year, Williams, Sauber, and Alpine, have zero points. And just how big, of, more of how much of the gap there is from, I'd say, the top five teams. RB is probably, I think, maybe the, the only kind of floater team and then the bottom four teams, it seems that there, there isn't as that tight midfield battle like there was last year. It seems to be a class of four and a half, five teams, depending on which Aston Martin shows up. And the, the other five teams fighting for the other um, scrappy points. So uh, like James Vowell said at, at the start of, uh, of this weekend, or I guess midway through the weekend, and maybe we'll transition to there uh, in, a, in a little bit, but just on how much each single point is going to be important for millions and millions of dollars of prize money for those bottom four or five teams. And I think it's going to, that's it's shown very early here at the start of the season uh, of how hard those points are going to be to come by for those smaller teams. Yeah, I mean, it's very unfortunate that they had to lose a car and a driver this weekend um, and basically suffer completely because they didn't get they didn't achieve anything out of it. Unfortunately, no, he, didn't get a point. he did get a point. No, no, he didn't even get a point. Yeah, that's what I'm, OK, OK. Yeah, that's what I was getting at. I'm like, he, didn't get, he didn't even get a point. No, so, I mean, what was the point of all that? I mean, why not let Logan Sargent practice? If they're going to choose him for their driver for 2024, I feel like he needs more drives in a car than Alex Albon. But well, well, let's, I just, you want to dive into it, Chris? Yeah, yeah. I was about to say, okay. let's segue into this because I've I've been really wanting to talk about this topic ever since it happened, yeah. and we didn't have much back and forth in in our message group. So let's let's break this down because I'm curious what you guys' thoughts are. And again, just quick review for those of you who don't know, Alex Albon crashed in FP1, same corner that George Russell eventually crashed in, and he damaged the tub of the monocoque. It was beyond repair. Williams did not have a spare monocoque there at the at the Grand Prix, meaning that they couldn't run their uh, car that Alex Albon crashed. So James Vowles and the team made the executive decision that they're going to hand Logan Sargent's car over to Alex Albon because they felt that Albon was the their best chance at scoring points or the best result. And I, I would say from this decision that I would say, yes, Alex Albon is the better driver and Alex Albon, I would almost say out of 24 races, almost 24 times is probably going to be the better driver and have the more chances to score points. But for me personally, I think that from, from James Vowles and from the Williams management perspective, this was the wrong decision. And it was the wrong decision because as you mentioned there, Shaker, this is a driver that they re-signed for 2024. They put the faith in this driver because they obviously put gave him another year in the car. 
And now they totally just crushed and absolutely obliterated any sort of confidence that Logan Sargent would have had trying to head into the season. And it just didn't, what really bothered me about this, people saying that, oh, you know, they were really criticizing Logan Sargent because, oh, you know, yes, it's unfair, but this is a harsh sport. It's Formula One. And I get all that. And they were saying, okay, well, maybe if Sargent was a better driver, this thing wouldn't happen. But the thing is, is I really saw almost no criticism of Alex Albon here. And Alex Albon is a very talented driver, but he was the one who binned it in FP1. And for you, to, a driver of his experience, to make a mistake like that in the first free practice session, knowing full well Williams doesn't have enough spare parts like that, that's a huge mistake. And then you go on and reward that driver by giving him his teammates drive. Something just doesn't, doesn't seem right about that picture to me, regardless of the fact that he's a better driver than Logan Sargent. I believe that they made the wrong decision. And I'd like to get your guys' thoughts on this, but from in my opinion, I think that this driver team relationship will be beyond repair now. It's going to be very difficult for Logan Sargent, in my opinion, to gain any sort of momentum in the coming races after what happened in Australia. Yeah, I agree with a lot of things that, that you said there, Chris, but I, I'm not going to put the blame on James Vowles. Uh, well, maybe a little bit on him, but I'm not going to put the blame on Albon in this circumstance as, either. I'm going to put the blame on the, the entire Williams operation staff and maybe even the, the funding partners of not being able to get a, mono, a spare monocoque down to Australia. And, and I'm sure that, you know, budget wise, you know, maybe they thought, oh, we can save some bucks here by not bringing another monocoque. I guarantee you that's not going to happen again. I guarantee you there's going to be three chassis at every Grand Prix from now on to avoid this situation. And I think maybe every team but we'll be doing that, right? But it, you have to, in my opinion, it, you know, if you're so worried about every single point, then why are you taking the chance of only being able to race one car? Because two cars are have a lot better chance at a point than one car does. Um, so I think that whether it's the funding, wh whether it's operations wise, I, I think that's a mistake uh, from Williams before the Grand Prix even started, just to, to not have a spare. Um, a, a spare chassis and you, know, you just put this up here chris I mean, having a tough time to repair alex albon's chassis in time for the next race and it won't have a spare tub ready by then i mean this is stuff that in my opinion should this shouldn't be this is formula one this isn't this isn't formula two this isn't you know another feeder series this is the top echelon of motorsport and for you not to have a, a spare tub ready to go at all times for situations like this frankly, is a little bit embarrassing by, by Williams. It is. And I, I hate to say that because Williams have been very, very nice to us in the past with uh, interviews with Nicholas Latifi and being so, so, um, so easy to, to be, um, to, so easy to, to communicate with and, and to deal with. And I can't thank them enough for what they've given us, but I have to call them out here. It's, it's just unfortunate. And, and it's not something you'd like to see uh, at a Formula One. I mean, what, are they going to race one car next week too? Like that's that'd be unacceptable if that's the case. And Shaker, I'll let you, I'll let you get in here. But I just this this whole starting Albon and, and sitting Logan, it, like you said, Chris, it, it's not fair to Logan. Um, you know, yes, I will agree that Albon will be the better driver there. But you know, it's like sitting. It's it's rewarding someone for for making a mistake, and, and that's not something that I think should be going on. I think this is, that is a prime opportunity for Logan to show, hey, don't worry, guys. I got this. I, this is my time to step up. I'll get one for the team. And, and you know, it's a prime opportunity for Logan uh, to show his worth for the Williams team. And, and they didn't allow him to do that. And I thought James Valls explained his decision as best he could. I thought it was a very good explanation. I just don't agree with the actual situation that he presented to his drivers. And I feel really bad for Logan. And uh, I hope that he comes out next race if he races because of Al Albon's mistake uh, and, and scores the first points this season for Williams and scores his first points as a Formula One driver. Would that be right? He scored one last year in uh, Austin, Texas. Perfect. Okay. So yeah, I don't know what you thought your thoughts are, Shaker, but that's uh, I feel very strongly about this. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I think when you guys first brought it up in our group chat. I think I was the one who was like, how are they allow how are they basically giving Alex Albon like a like a get away from jail card basically for bidding his vehicle and then basically awarding him with another drive? Um 
I, you know, if we put it in terms of like, it's probably not the same relation because obviously, you know, in other sports, if you're playing soccer or hockey, uh, you don't have a vehicle. You have your, you know, you have your body parts. You know, you go out drinking the night beforehand. You show up hungover. The coach isn't going to put you on. Um, he's going to put on the player that showed up and train and didn't basically go out drinking the night beforehand. Uh, no matter how great of a driver you are, you shouldn't be, or like player you are, you shouldn't be given the drive or you know the position to play just because you know you're some amazing driver. Um, and like going into Japan, knowing that Albon is from Thailand as well, and we're going into an Asian race, the sponsorship that he probably brings into Asian races is probably a little bit bigger than what Logan Sargent brings in. Um, if they're only going to be racing with one car, are they going to do the same thing again or give Logan Sargent the actual drive and give him a chance? Like you guys said, I, I we don't really know. Um, I, I think I agree. Like, you, you know, um, James gave a great explanation for why they're giving Alex Albon the seat, but I don't think it's a reasonable explanation. Um, you know, you put your faith in the driver for 2024. There were so many other uh, drivers that were basically sitting in the sitting uh, sitting uh, on the bench waiting to be picked up, and you decided to go with Logan Sargent again, um, who didn't have a great 2023 year overall. Um, who had other drivers, you know, like Liam Lawson that showed up uh, for the one drive that he had, and he was unbelievable. Um, you know, you have so many other drivers that you could choose from, but you decided to go with Logan Sargent and you still didn't put faith in him in, in the fourth race of the season. Um, so what, what are you going to do for next year? Is Logan Sargent even going to want to race for you if this shit happens again? So it, it's, it's a loss of trust as well with the team, I think with Logan, um, cause you, now he's not going to know if this situation happens again, if they're going to have parts available, if it's his car or is his car going to be sacrificed for Alex Albon car for his parts? You know, it, it's, it's a very, it's a huge loss of trust with the team as well. So. That, that's a great word that you use there. Trust. I, I think that that is totally gone and is beyond repair at this point because from Logan Sargent's side, you travel all the way to Australia, you show up, you do the preparation, you do your free practice sessions, you, you know, you stay out of trouble for the most part. He did have that spin, but he didn't bin it or anything like that. And then you have to sit on the sidelines and watch your own teammate take over your car for a mistake that he made. It, it, it's just totally, totally wrong for me. And I think that from from Sargent's perspective, when you really look at it, it's they resigned him. But you're kind of thinking to yourself now, it's like, well, why, why does Williams need two cars then? Maybe they get to save some money and just run one car then. I mean, if they have such little faith in Logan Sargent for his ability to get a good result or to score points, why bother even bringing two cars to any Grand Prix this season? You might as well just have, give it all to Albon and, and let him do his best. And the craziest thing of all in the race, Albon didn't even score points. Okay, he got better. He he performed, I'm sure, better than Sargent would have, would it? but he didn't even score any points. At the end of the day, it was kind of all for nothing. And I just have to give credit to Logan Sargent to say for him to be able to show up for qualifying and for the race after what happened to him, that's a huge credit to his character because I think a lot of drivers or other people in that situation would have been like, see ya, I'm going home because I'm not dealing with this shit right now. So I, I think he was very hard done by. And Tyler, to your point, yes, it, you can't blame Alex Albon for obviously taking the, the drive. And it, it's a mistake. It happens. Drivers crash all the time. But, but really, this highlights a big problem for Williams and it's and it's a real shame too because you kind of felt that they were past this and now they've it's almost felt like they slipped back to where they were a couple of years ago where like you said it's getting to an embarrassing level and especially with denying Andretti for example and this happens to a team like this it's it's it really really was a bad look for F1 this weekend what happened yeah uh, absolutely I agree and I hope Logan gets the drive and and Outscores Albon. I like. I'm really cheering for Logan now for the rest of the season. Um, I just I feel like he he deserves a little bit more a little bit more respect there because um, I think he got a lot of a lot of lack of respect from his team, unfortunately. And um, yeah, it's. I hope I hope they can figure something out there. I mean, you just hate to see a, a driver who's talented. You, you can't. Yes, Logan may not be a, a future world champion, but he's in Formula One. He's a very talented driver. 
Um, and to deny someone who's worked so hard to, to get to that level is at that level and does everything right, like you said, Chris, um, and to deny him a drive. And, and not because it was, you know, if this was a mechanical issue, of, if Albon's engine blew and they didn't have any spare parts uh, and said, you know what, we can only one run car, one car this weekend and we're going to run Albon, I would give it, I'd say, you know what, harsh, but I would have a lot more leniency with that than just putting Albon in because he, he'd been the other car. So, um, you know, does this story change if Albon scores a point? Do we go, what a brilliant decision by Williams and James Vowles to make the best out of a crappy situation? Maybe, but the story is that they, they didn't get any points. So um, we can't think of, of that scenario. I, You know what? I think I would have been more okay with it if – Alex Albon did race and they were like, you know, fine. I'm fine with that. He, they're saying that he's a better driver and he's going to race, but I don't think Alex Albon, if he did get a point should have gone in. And I think that point should have still gone to Logan Sargent because he raced in his car and in his number. But that's my personal opinion on the matter. I think I would have been more okay with that. Uh, if Logan Sargent still got the points in the end, because it was his car. I, for me, I still would have had the same opinion, regardless if he would have scored points. Because the thing is, is think about it: if Alex Albon scores points, it looks even worse for Logan Sargent, because now everything that people are going to be talking about is, well, look, Alex Albon scored points at Logan Sargent's car. Uh, Alex Albon made it to Q two in Logan Sargent's car. Now you're not really hearing that much discussion because of okay, all the other things that happened in the race. So that's kind of gone to the wayside, which is good news for Sargent. But again, getting back to it, it's only the fourth race, or excuse me, actually only the third race of the season. Okay, Alex Albon outqualified, outraced him in the first two two races, but it's still early. Like to me, you still got to give your drivers equal treatment to let them be able to battle it out and to prove themselves. And especially for a guy like Sargent, who was really trying to build up his confidence from a difficult 2023, he really needed that time in the car, and he really needs these early races and opportunities to show Williams that I can get on par with Alex Albon. And now it's going to be really difficult for him to do so. And uh, yeah, I, I think it's a very, very tough situation for him. Let's see how he bounces back in Suzuka. But this is another very interesting situation with Williams because the fact that they're not going to have maybe even another spare tub going into Suzuka, that's that's going to be interesting. What if another crash happens and and Alex or for Alex or for Logan, they have to give up their cars. I mean, well, what a wild uh, situation this this whole thing was, but. I know we had some of our uh, commenters, actually uh, Sven from the Netherlands commented on a, an, an old video after the uh, incident happened. And a lot of fans out there had uh, had some uh, good good opinions and uh, were kind of outraged or upset about the whole situation. So let's hope we never see it again. And I hope Williams can get their, their shit together, for lack of a better term, because they really got to for, for the sake of themselves. But um, I felt like this is a good opportunity for another solid transition here, because at this very corner that Alex Albon crashed in, form in FP1, we had another large incident that happened. And that actually happened on the final lap of the race. As Carlos Sainz was cruising to uh, his victory, we had quite the dramatic action <laughs> between Fernando Alonso and George Russell. Now, if you guys are only listening, I recommend you head over to our YouTube channel, watch the video, because we're going to be watching the incident and some telemetry as well. So uh, head on over there if you were just listening. But let me play it through for you guys here, and then I'm going to get your thoughts on whether the penalty was deserved or not. So let me just give you a heads up that the first little bit of this video is going to show the previous lap, the uh, the two drivers going through the corner, and then it will show the final lap of them going through the corner and when the actual incident happened. Of course, as usual, fingers crossed that Formula One doesn't take this down for copyright. So I will continue to talk over and you see entering here turn six. So this is lap 56. They go through smoothly. And now we're going to go on to the final lap, lap 57. And as you can see here, approaching the same corner and you notice Fernando going a little bit much slower into that corner. Russell loses it and then bins it into the middle of the track. Of course, the car went up onto its tires as well, and then uh, that was it. And Fernando Alonso crossed the line, but ended up getting a 20-second penalty post-race for, uh, for dangerous driving. So, Tyler, let me start with you. What did you think of the penalty? Do you agree the penal with the penalty? And, uh, yeah, let's start with there. <laughs> 
But yeah, no, hundred percent. Um, the first, the, the Russell incident. Now I'm not in the car, so maybe it felt a lot more violent than what it looked. But like, I feel the ending scene made the crash like a lot more violent than what it was, in my opinion. I mean, it looks like Russell did a great job of kind of mitigating the the impact to the wall as much as he could with the way he angled his car into the wall. Um, just a really awkward area. You see, if you didn't listen to the team radio, you could hear the panic in George's voice to call for a red flag. We've seen that in the past with Lance Stroll in Azerbaijan. Um, are you play it again here, Chris? The, uh, yeah, yeah. We'll slowly replay yeah. as you talk. Well, I really like the angle. Like, if you look, he angles the car really well to to not have a huge impact into the wall. Obviously, the tethers on the on the tires got caught underneath the car, which led it to go onto that kind of weird 45 degree angle. Um, but yeah, the sheer panic in his voice to call for a red flag. And like I was saying, like we, we heard that with Lance Stroll in the past when he was caught in the middle of the track uh, at Azerbaijan and trying to red flag the race. And maybe we'll touch on that in a little bit. Maybe if you guys think they should have red flagged the race or if a VSC was good enough. But I didn't I haven't seen the telemetry yet, so I'm really interested to see kind of what happened in the end with Alonso. Now he was saying on the team radio that his throttle was acting weird um which was a weird way of covering up i would have gone with like uh something was here here we go okay so we got yeah this is uh what's going on here chris yeah so we got uh this tweet for am racing f1 i think it's courtesy of f1 underscore temple there's a lot of these but this one i picked out because it was kind of the most simplest one i i will be honest admit i'm not the best at reading telemetry but i'll read what the tweet says here it says uh, alonzo breaks significantly earlier ahead of russell on lap 57 moments before he crashed 37 kilometers per hour slower than a lap earlier normally full throttle at that point then he got back on throttle before lifting again ahead of the apex and then here you can see that highlighted there this is the throttle mark over here and then this is the uh, brake as well so saying that on lap 57 he did put on a little more brakes than he did on the previous lap and as well as a lot more lifting so off throttle as well and you could see it from the video that he did slow significantly which is what he got the penalty for so i mean the telemetry is there it backs that alonzo brake tested him and um you know, was there an issue with Alonso's car? I don't know. I, I'm sure that if the stewards would have given it a 20 second penalty if there was an issue with Alonso's car. So I think we may have to rule that out of the question. In 20 seconds is it the right the the right penalty? Yeah, I actually think they got it really right on this one. At first, I wasn't sure, you know, if it'd be you know 10 seconds or maybe a, a grid place drop for next race. But uh, and maybe the grid place drop for next race may have been more appropriate. Actually, not thinking of it. Because uh, I only dropped him one position and it was to his teammate. So Aston Martin got the same amount of points in the end. Um, but it, it's, it is, it caused a crash. It was a dangerous, dangerous uh, move from Alonso. Caused a, a dangerous crash where it could have seriously injured Russell if, uh, if there was someone right behind him and, and smacked into him. So um, I, I think the, I think that's the appropriate decision. And you know, a lot of gamesmanship, you're fighting for world championship points and, um, incidents like that are just unfortunate to see, and I'm sure Alonzo will have second uh, second thoughts of doing that again. Um, it's just really smart racing. <laughs> 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 no, I, I I totally agree. I think with the pe- uh, well, totally agree with the penalty. Um, I mean, you can't, you can't break check in a circumstance where you're, you know, every other time, every other lap you like, you know, break like almost what was it 0.3 seconds afterwards or whatever it was. Um, so I, I, I think you can't break check in that situation when you know, the driver's about to pass you on the final lap of the race. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if Russell would have got by him though. Pardon? I don't know if Russell would have got by him. I don't know either, but there's still a chance, right? I mean, in the end, you're right. He only did lose two places, so it wasn't worth it to take the chance um, for that to happen. But, I mean, maybe he's telling the truth. Maybe he did have a throttle issue. Who knows? (laughs) (laughs) But like I said, just really smart racing. But in the end, not very smart racing because you got the penalty. (laughs) I... uh... (laughs) 
but before I give my opinion, we have to we have to show this video uh, again for for viewers out there listening. You gotta you gotta head over to YouTube. We got we got some good stuff on this episode, but uh, I, I think this more comes down to uh, Russell's last lap inabilities that we've seen in the past, and I think this was more of the same in this race. This was kind of pretty much how it went. And uh, this was similar to Singapore also <laughs> last year. So if uh, for our listeners out there, we're showing uh, the Top Gear clip of when uh, Jeremy Clarkson totally binned the Reliant Robin coming out of a corner. So, uh, yeah, very similar to, uh, <laughs> to, to George Russell there. You know what I pictured in my head is the Fast and Furious 4 scene when Vin Diesel, like, two wheels his car. <laughs> like... <laughs> <laughs> and all I thought was Russell. I'm a terrible person. All I thought was Russell being like, this one's for family. <laughs> like trying to take it right around the corner. Oh, God. Uh, is, uh, is it something I saw something on, on Twitter that George Russell has been in on the last lap in all three of Carl Sainz's victories or the last yeah. three Carl Sainz victories? The last two, yeah, yeah. Last in two. Singapore. Last three. Well, no, because the, the his first victory that was the first lap crash. Remember with the when uh, Zhou Guan Yu went upside down. Oh, that's right. Yeah, that's right. But I think that was it. That's basically he's crashed in every single race that Carlos yeah. Sainz has won. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm you know I'm actually going to disagree with you guys on on this one because I'm not so sold on the whole brake check theory here because when we look on the, the telemetry and going back to that tweet. We said that he, again, it's I guess it's what you define as a brake check because yes, he did break earlier, but when we look at that type of corner, it's not necessarily a hairpin 90 degree stop go corner. It's a corner where you're carrying through a lot of speed. And as Alonzo, I'm gonna bring up his tweet a little bit later, as he said too, these are kind of sort of techniques that he was doing where he was going to sacrifice entry speed in order to gain a better exit and he was also harvesting a lot more in order to get more energy for the long straight that followed after the turn six corner. So I'm thinking there that I, I don't know if Fernando Alonso should be responsible for George Russell binning it. Because in my opinion, this was George Russell's mistake. And Alonso didn't touch him or anything like that. I mean, Russell made the mistake. And I think that the prerogative is on Russell to anticipate what the driver in front is doing and to be able to take the necessary action to try and avoid it, which means to break a little bit earlier or lift off. But we've seen this before in the past with Russell, that he does make these mistakes on last lap moves and also in wheel-to-wheel -wheel racing. And the thing with the penalty too is, uh, again, the problem with the FIA is I feel like they always shoot themselves in the foot with the wording of the, the penalty that they gave out. I'm going to bring in the document here. This, As you guys can see, this is the official FIA document on the penalty. I'm not going to read the whole thing here, but you guys will be able to find it online. And I'll just read quickly here that uh, car 63, George Russell, was following car 14, Fernando Alonso, approximately 0.5 seconds behind as the cars approached turn 6. Alonso explained to the stewards that he intended to approach turn 6 differently, lifting earlier and with less speed into the corner to get a better exit, just as I mentioned. Russell explained to the stewards that from his perspective, Alonso's maneuver was erratic, took him by surprise and caused him to close distance unusually fast and with the resulting lower downforce at the apex of the corner, etc, etc. Now here's the telemetry part. The telemetry shows that Alonso lifted slightly more than 100 meters earlier than he ever had going into that corner during the race. He also braked very slightly at a point he did not usually break, although the amount of brake was so slight that it was not the main reason for his car slowing. So there's another reason why I don't necessarily think it was a brake test. And he downshifted at a point he never usually he never usually downshifted. He then upshifted again and accelerated to the corner before lifting again to make the corner. And then it goes on to say about Alonso's plan. But I want to bring out the second part of this document, which is uh, kind of the confusing part, because after it starts about it talks about the articles and things like that. It gets to this part, which is very kind of an interesting read from an official stewarding document, but it says, should Alonzo have the right to try a different approach to the corner? Yes. Should Alonzo be responsible for dirty air that ultimately caused the incident? 
No. Then it says, however, did he choose to do something with whatever intent that was extraordinary, i.e. lifting, breaking, downshifting, and all other elements of the maneuver over 100 meters earlier than previously and much greater than was needed to simply slow earlier for that corner? Yes, by his own account of the incident, he did. And it is this opinion of the stewards by doing these things, he drove in a manner that was at very least potentially dangerous, given the very high speed nature of the point of the track. So this paragraph there really for me just kind of doesn't sit right with me in terms of the penalty given because they kind of just admitted that what he did wasn't necessarily wrong, but it, he just did it a little bit too much. But I don't know the the whole wording from from that decision by the stewards just does not sit right with me because well, it sounds like an an opinion blog post is what it sounds like <laughs> right that's <laughs> what I'm saying like th there's a little bit of technical part in that first page where they kind of explain the telemetry and things like that yeah. but even even getting that just as I lose my mic there even getting back to that point of the first page um, which I think was really interestingly worded here uh, if I just bring it up quickly once again. I think that this is interesting here that they said that the amount of brake was so slight that it was not the main reason for his car slowing. And then after he downshifted a point that he never usually downshifted. So for me, again, this whole thing comes down to he for me, he essentially got penalized for just using a tactical move on track. And now if we look at in the previous race, Kevin Magnuson, how slowly he was driving, could we consider that dangerous driving or doing things erratically? Because he was slowing down quite significantly versus what they should have been driving at the pace in those corners. So, I mean, I don't know. I guess maybe I wouldn't be so confused if it wasn't for that stewarding document, in my opinion, honestly. But, like, I mean, maybe splitting the two. I mean, Magasin didn't end up causing a, a crash and Alonzo's incident had a crash involved in it. I won't say it caused it, but it had a crash involved in it. So the stewards maybe had to step in for, the, for that scenario where if, if Russell didn't bin it, I don't think we hear anything of it. Yeah, and, and that's very interesting, right? So th that gets back to the point. Was Alonzo yeah. the reason for the crash? Yeah, it's a good... I mean, I never would have really put that perspective in. So it's a very good perspective that you brought. Here, here's my, my point of view. Um, I, I personally think he got the, from what I understand from that and taking from what you said about, um, Kevin Magnuson, um, Kevin Magnuson, it seemed like he was doing it throughout the race where I, I would personally like to see Alonzo's telemetry throughout all of their laps because did he try the exact same thing earlier in the race or was that like the first time he tried it? on the very last lap of the race, you know, then I can see it be as the two words being uh, seeing it as erratic for the fact that like, that's the first time he's trying that move all weekend. He never tried it at all. And I just think it is the first time he's trying it. So the fact that there was a downshift and then he upshifted again, and that was the change for speed is how I read it. You know, and, like, that's why I think maybe the steward saw as erratic. Um, but I also get your point of view. You're right. Like he didn't technically touch Russell uh, to cause the crash. It's it's a weird circumstance. And I think just for the fact that he never tried it beforehand in any other part of the race is why the stewards are saying it's erratic. Maybe, you know. I, I think that is their reasoning, but it's also explanatory from Alonzo's side is that yeah. he didn't do it in other parts of the race because he didn't have Russell breathing down his neck on a last lap to try and overtake him. So mm -hmm. it's a, it's a, it is a very difficult thing. And I think I was reading a tweet, maybe if it was from Alex Brundle, who was saying that, you know, penalizing a driver for essentially, yeah, because there was no contact between the cars, there's nothing like that. So penalizing, you kind of essentially penalized Alonzo for Russell spinning out and, and crashing which is how I see it. And um, I, I don't know, it, it's a very difficult one. And, and that FIA document certainly does not help clear it up. I think it would have been a lot easier without that document to to avoid the confusion. But um, I, I think as we all know, Fernando Alonso certainly wasn't happy with the decision post race because he posted a very long tweet. I might even call it a little bit of a short story here. Oh, um, 
Yeah, I'm not going to read out the whole thing to you guys. You can find it on his official account on Twitter. Um, but I'll read just a part of it here. He says, quote, a bit surprised by a penalty at the end of the race regarding how we should approach the corners or how we should drive the race cars. At no point do we want to do anything wrong at those speeds. I believe that without gravel on that corner or any other corner in the world, we would never have even investigated. In F1 with over 20 years of experience with epic duels like... <laughs> 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 Fernando just, man, he's a good politician. With epic duels like like Imola 2005, 06, Brazil 2023, changing racing lines, sacrificing entry speed to have good exits from corners is part of the art of motorsport. He continues on to say, we never drive at 100% every race lap in every corner. We save fuel, tires, brakes. So being responsible for not making every lap the same is a bit surprising. And then he just follows up by saying, we have to accept it and think about Japan to have more pace and fight for positions further up the field. Thank you, team. What a he is a legend. That's a great yeah. <laughs> That's a great tweet. <laughs> yeah, I mean, wherever you sit on this, deserve penalty, not deserve penalty, Lonzo fan, not I mean, he is a legend. Yeah. Just for stuff awesome. like that, man. He's he's awesome. Now, yeah. do you guys think there should have been a red flag there? Do you are you okay with the VSC? Because we saw how much George was screaming for a red flag and, and everything like that, and on the last stop of the race. I don't think the red flag would have mattered because I mean, you he would have went started the you would have started the race and then once they cross the start finish line the race is over right so so i don't know i don't understand why they wouldn't have done a red flag and just said the session will not be restarted because it was a very dangerous area that he was parked in at the exit of a corner in the middle of a track in a very vulnerable position with the the high speed too high speed corner yeah so i just want to get your guys thoughts on that if you're happy with the vsc or if you think there should have been a red flag I, I feel like personally, the fact that he was not halfway down the grid, but close to eighth or ninth place is one of the reasons they didn't go with the red flag because a lot of the drivers were through already. But I mean, I it should have been a red flag and most likely end of the race with how bad that crash was and how much area it took up on the track itself. Um, yeah. I think I would have been okay with the red flag too as well. I'm, I'm not sure if they've come out with an explanation as to why they haven't. The only thing that I would maybe think of is that they saw on the GPS, the driver tracking, that Russell didn't have anybody close behind him. And so that they thought that they had enough time to VSC it and then for engineers to let their drivers know that there's a big crash ahead. Um, I think otherwise maybe they would have thrown the red flag quicker had there been a, a car closer to to Russell in that regard. But I think in that case, seeing how big it was and exactly like you said, Tyler, the position of the car and the corner, it would have just made sense to throw the red flag right away because we all know drivers then immediately slow down right away. VSC was a little, I, I, I don't know, VSC to me was almost a little bit too light for that situation just because they're still doing quite some high speeds even at, at virtual safety car with that Delta time. So uh, I think probably a red flag in that situation would have been the safer call. And just quickly, I know that there were some things going on online that, uh, as you mentioned there, the panic in Russell's voice uh, when he realized after he crashed where he was on the track. And some people were suggesting that he was uh, calling for a red flag to save his position in the race it, to, to essentially still score points in that regard. So I think that that's a, a ridiculous theory because a driver in that position after a huge crash like that wouldn't first be thinking of his position in the race or something like that. I think he was just like Lance Stroll was a few years ago, really genuinely concerned about his position on the track and knowing where he was, he was concerned about safety. So I think those yeah. uh, theories or comments were ridiculous. Yeah, I'd be shitting my pants if I was in a scenario. Yeah. Like, yeah. Well, no doubt. It's a scary spot to be in. It's not like you can see who's coming around the corner. Like the bottom of the car is pointed to where the cars are coming in. So you have no clue what's going on. You're not focused on Delta time and who's behind you. You don't know really, like as long as you don't see someone, right? So, no. Yeah, yeah. Red flag. I think it's a little bit ridiculous because um, I mean that's not the first thing that comes to any driver's mind when they get into a crash. It's you know, it's a is like, am I on fire? And B, are the other drivers going to be safe? I feel like there are two things that come into their head, or like, am I hurt? You know, so yeah, it's it's a weird thing to think about that that you know they're thinking about the track positioning first. Like I know they're out there, you know, they're they're drivers and athletes, but I I feel like. 
when stuff like that happens on in any kind of sport and somebody gets badly injured or gets into a crash, the first thing on everyone's mind is, are they safe? And I think we've seen that in every onboard when a crazy crash happens is every driver who's still in the race, the first response, the first thing they ask is, who is it and are they okay? Yep. Yep, it was it was very interesting, very interesting whole incident and uh, and the penalty situation as well. So yeah, let let us know what you guys' thoughts are in the comment section, and uh, we'll see we'll see what unfolds after uh, after this uh, decision by the stewards and how they treat something like this for the future as well. Mm -hmm. So that about does it for me for all the things I had on the Australian Grand Prix. I'll uh, I'll leave some final thoughts to you if there's anything that uh, we missed from the race or anything else in the F1 world you wanted to talk about. No, I'm trying to rack my brain quickly on what other things that, that happened. I mean, kudos to Oscar Piastri for a P4 finish. I, th I thought, I know there's a lot of controversy in Australia going around on the driver's swap between Norris and Piastri, but in the end, I mean, it showed how I mean, Norris was pretty far ahead. So I think it may have been the right decision. I think Norris would have got by anyways. So really good weekend for McLaren um, and a great weekend for Haas as well. Double points for them with... Uh, with everything going on after Russell was out. So kudos to Haas with four points on the season now and uh, taking control of that um, lower mid-pack battle. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, I, I love Piastri's attitude during that swap, though. Mm. Uh, I think on the team radios where I think uh, Norris came on and he's like, I'm faster. He's like, all right, mate, well, then go for it. <laughs> he's like, he's totally happy. You know, if the, his driver's doing performing a little better, and driving faster, he's not going to hold them back from that drive, you know. So I, I really like uh, the uh, the team relationship between Norris and Piastri for for that to happen and not look like I know I know Australian you know the Australian fans are upset, but I, as as just a pure racing fan, it was really nice to see him not being upset by it. So compared to the last few years where we've seen it with Ferrari and Mercedes and stuff like that. Yeah, it was a good decision. I mean, it was a different tire. I think different tire strategies as well, and uh, I think Lando had had the edge in this race. But I mean, Oscar's been a lot more closer this season as well too, so that should be a good battle. But the main thing was is great points from McLaren. The P three, P four was uh, was excellent for them. So yeah, good weekend. Um, yeah, and credit to Haas. I, I think they've done really good so far this year under uh, new team principal Ao Kamatsu. I really like how he's how he's handled the team so far this year, and uh, Haas is pretty solid not as bad as we thought and who would have thought we saw Gunter steiner this weekend with the post race i mean we'll yeah. need some work first on camera appearance for Gunter, but uh, need some need some help there but uh that was a surprise i wasn't expecting him yeah i think the drivers were surprised too most of them didn't <laughs> understand his questions but i mean great to see him yeah, anyways, though. yeah i think he's fulfilling that character role that he had on drive to survive and he even admitted himself he kind of overstayed at Haas he, he said he should have left a little bit sooner so um, it, it's nice to see some fresh faces injected into into Haas and it's working so far and of course the fact that Ferrari's doing well usually kind of means Haas does a little bit better as well so that battle is going to be tight and I think uh, they have a shot for maybe even like P7 in the Constructors Championship so yeah I think uh, overall it was a good race in Melbourne uh, don't get too excited about possibly a, a close championship or a Red Bull de being dethroned. Uh, Albert Park is always a very unique track. It's not like really any of the others that we have on the calendar. So we typically get some of these uh, kind of quirky results, let's let's say. But uh, if I want to give some hope to the Tifosi out there, the uh, team that finishes 1-2 at the Australian Grand Prix has won the world championship in that year every single time that's happened so wow. hey you never know you never know the records are meant to be broken <laughs> Tafosi fans are going crazy right now <laughs> yeah, you just inspire the entire the entire nation of Italy is up on their feet listening to that now. yep yep but uh, I do have to remind you that the last time we went to Suzuka after Max Verstappen had lost a Grand Prix, he ended up smashing everybody by over, I think, 25 seconds to go on to dominate the race. So, It's one of his favorite tracks, I think, behind Spa. Or, yeah, I think it's, it's up there. I think it's one of his top three tracks uh, or favorite tracks. Life, so. Yeah, it's like Spa, the uh, Suzuka, and then I think now he loves the Dutch Grand Prix as well as yeah, one of his I top know. three. <laughs> um, yeah. 
but yeah, no, I, I think anytime Max has a bad race or he DNFs, he always comes back and just smashes everybody out of the park or whenever he has those like P10 or P15 starts and comes out of nowhere to win it. I think, I think whenever he goes out, he gets a little fire lit in him again. You know, he's like, oh yeah, you know, I guess I could win the next one. So, um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's going to be a good race. Suzuka's always amazing. Yeah, and I'm really interested to see what kind of or how different the track is with it being a spring race uh, compared to the tr- very, very traditional fall race uh, near end of the season over there. So um, I'm kind of annoyed that they changed tradition, but um, if I don't know, I, I guess schedules, right? Schedules were schedules. Um, but we'll see what kind of what kind of track Suzuka is in the springtime and see if it changes the racing dynamic at all. Yeah, definitely. And uh, yeah, Suzuka, Japan, Japanese Grand Prix, next one coming up. Not this weekend, of course. It will be uh, the weekend following. So that should be exciting to see how uh, everyone bounces back. And uh, we're looking forward to it. Always one of the best Formula One circuits and just racing circuits in general in yeah. the entire world. So excited for that race as well. And as usual, we'll be there to uh, uh, back or we'll be there after the race to recap all of the action from the 2024 Japanese Grand Prix. In the meantime, we do obviously have other content on the, our YouTube channel. So head over there and check out our latest videos. You can listen to our podcast there on video form. And we've also got some clips coming out from the podcast as well that we post there. And of course, if you're just listening on the podcast player applications, whether it's iTunes or iHeartRadio, Spotify, whatever it is, leave us a subscription there and also rate our podcast as well. That helps us greatly. So thanks, everybody, for joining. This has been episode 141 of the BMF One Show podcast. For Chris, for excuse me, not for me, for Tyler McDonald, for Shaker Vardy, I've been Chris Cato. We'll see you guys again very soon. Enjoy the rest of your week. Have a good one.